to call the uh, November 20th, 2019 regular meeting of the Fenton Community High School District 100 regular board meeting to order. Um, Mary, may I have a roll call? Yes. Jalwick? Here. Peyton Howell? Here. Figueroa? Here. Rago? Ramirez? Here. Ting Paul Pong? Wiedemann? Here. All right, we have a quorum. Uh, please join me in reciting the Pledge of, of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. And Mary, do we have any requests for public comment? We have none. None. Okay, thank you. Then uh, we'll move on to the district's district reports, James. Uh, we go with, uh, did you do a mission and statement, mm -hmm. I believe? No, we didn't. Let's, I'm sorry, go to that. that was, Sam. Sam, I'm sorry. Sam, okay. if you could read that <laughs> first. <laughs> Our mission, cultivate successful, passionate learners through rigor, relevance, and relationships. Our beliefs, successful, passionate learners thrive when we champion innovative teaching and engage learning, School and home collaborate effectively. We provide a safe, securing, and caring environment. We infuse social emotional learning into academics and culture. Diversity empowers our learning community, and we prepare students to fulfill their civic responsibility. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to recognitions. Uh, and Rick, if you could take that, please. Hi, good evening. We've got <clears throat> two groups of recognitions. Uh, they're from both sides of our district. Is it working? Our mixer is uh, busy. Oh, it's on. Is that better? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we got two groups of recognitions. Uh, they represent both sides of our district, one from Wooddale, one from Bensonville. So first we're going to go with uh, Victor Aristakisan. He was named, uh, it's not Volunteer of the Year, but it's a uh, uh, Bensonville's top volunteer award. Um, Village President Simone selected Victor as the first student to ever receive the award. And uh, he chose him primarily because of his dedication and the uh, consistency and how far Victor would travel to go and, and honor his commitment. So we've got Victor and his parents here. So Victor, we've got some cupcakes for you that you can take home. So we <laughs> wanted to celebrate you. Thank you very much. And uh, mom and dad, right? Yes, yes. So if you guys want to say anything, feel free to go ahead. Otherwise, we are extremely proud of you. You represented Fenton very well, and we're, we're glad that everyone agrees with us that you're an awesome student. Thank you. Would you guys like to take a picture before? Yeah, sure. Before you get to the next one, just yep. to remind all our audience here, uh, we, we we require 25 uh, community services oh, for yes. all of our students hours. to fulfill, hours, hours, yes, thank you, hours. to fulfill before their uh, senior year. 
Victor's already at 275. Wow. 275. <laughs> That's just unbelievable. Let's give him another hand of applause. Love you. Uh, next, we have some art students, and we wanted to uh, celebrate this because the Wooddale Library hosted 100 pieces of our art for two and a half weeks for the community to look at, and then the library staff and library board uh, selected some winners. And I attended, and it was slammed. It was an absolutely packed room, and it was a wonderful thing to see. And it's great to see the world through the, the children's eyes and the way that they depict it with their art. So it was, a, it was a cold day, so not everyone was able to make it out. We wanted to bring some people in and recognize them in our house because it was some standing art. So I'm going to turn it over to our art teachers. Miss Rieger and Miss Jima. Yeah. All right, we want to thank you so much for having this opportunity to present these amazing artists before our board. There were a hundred artists that were at the um, that were chosen to be presented at the Wooddale Library Art Show, which was on November twelfth, and eighteen of those students. Um, were recognized with a special award from the, the board. And those 18 students represent, um, some of them are re represented behind me, represent hundreds and hundreds of hours collectively of hard work um, with their artwork. So we are proud of these artists and their accomplishments, and we want to recognize them. So for 2D art, we had second place, Jesenia Loya. And for AP Studio 2D Art, we had Megan Pate with second place and Sydney Menard with first place. <laughs> and in cartooning, we had third place was Liliana Martinez and second place was Leslie Mendoza Ortega. I didn't know what was going on behind me. I'll do it one more time. Just their names, and I'll have them raise their hand. Yesenia. There she is, our second place in 2D. And Megan Pate, second place in AP 2D. And then first place, Sydney Menard in AP 2D. And then cartooning, third place, Liliana Martinez. And then second place, Leslie Mendoza Ortega. Uh, can we do a photo? Sure. Board. Come on, kids. Any parents? Anyone wants to make sure you come up with me? Yeah, I know. We move on to board recognition. All right. <laughs> Last week, November 15th, was uh, National Board uh, uh, Festival Day, if you want to call it that way. So it's the 15th. We uh, here at, uh, at Fenton just want to thank each one of our board members for all of their hard work. We know it's a lot of work. It's a volunteer position. We put in hundreds of hours every year. Is it a bottle of wine? So, no, it's not a bottle of wine, but we just wanted to express from, from all of us, from Jackie to, to Marianne to Juliet to Kit to Paul, uh, Leo, okay. thank you. Um, and Patty, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you want to just take it out, I'll, you, I'll, we can talk about it a little bit. So. We are in educational, we are in the learning business, so we got you two books. One is Permission to, um, to, to Feel, 
Uh, it's really what we talked about SEL a lot. You hear that social emotional learning mm -hmm. ruler. You hear the mood, uh, the, the the mood meter. I think this is very powerful. Um, sometimes we're focused on academic intelligence or just the IQ intelligence mm -hmm. quotient, but it's the, the emotional is the key. You know, and we said it over and over. If, we, if there is a silver lining into public education, and that could save it and, and, and make it better, I think it's it truly is emotional intelligence. So that talks about that. And the next one is the end of average. We don't want average students, right? Yeah. We want students and beyond. Yeah. There's a really really good book in regards to that where um, the revolution in regards to education is headed. So. Hopefully we can we not can wine, some books but here. chocolate. There it is. There you go. <laughs> 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 Once again, thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you. Right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, very kind. Um, all right. Now we move on to the District Hundred reports. Public comments. We have no one, right, Mary? That's you, right. you said yes. Okay. So we have no one there. Uh, but now we move on to District 100 reports. And first we have is Colby, yeah. Colby yeah. Lewis. Hello, I, I love the mister, I don't usually get that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, good evening, uh, so I'm here to give you, give you an update on what we've been doing for the facility assessment. Uh, thank you, first of all, for trusting us to go ahead and, and do this. Uh, so, forward, I think that's the way it goes. So what, what I'm just, the outline of what I'm going to do is just first of all talk about what the purpose is of a, of a facility assessment, then give you kind of a timeline of where we're heading, and then just show you some images of kind of where we're at right now. We've made no conclusions. We're kind of just in the process of getting going. So, uh, so, so really, the facility assessment really is defining where you are with your facility. You know, so you can plan your your future of where where you want to take it to. So really, that starts by uh, by number one, determining the physical condition of your building, uh, and then we break that down into into really the exterior, so the buildings and grounds. So so we look at paving and sidewalks and drainage issues on the site and how the athletic facilities are going, and then. And then, uh, and, and then we really, we also always keep in mind, you know, what's going to be safe. So safety is kind of a key issue as we're looking at this. And so we kind of note, note how all of those things are. And then we look uh, at the actual building exterior. Uh, so that would be, you know, the brick masonry, the, the windows, the doors, the condition of those, how the sealants are and how the roofs, the condition of the roofs. And then we move on to the interiors, the finishes, and all of those things. And then we look at what are called the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems. And we look at each one of those and document those and kind of see, see the condition, how much age they, they, they're showing, what we think, how long it'll be until they need to be replaced and things. And so, so then the next step is after we do all that field work and leg work and documenting is that we come back and we start to determine the, you know, the costs and the, you know, the, what, what it takes to, you know, what, what costs would be to replace things. And then we analyze all that data and we, we, we kind of note which things should go first and second and kind of set priorities. And then the last part is the kind of, we, we like to develop, uh, you know, roadmaps for going forward that might go with like a, like a good, better, best, you know, kind of scenarios and give you some choices on how to approach going forward with your facilities. So that's really the thing. So it's really to give you a roadmap and the tools to kind of plan what you need to do with your buildings, your building. Uh, <clears throat> so the schedule as we see it is we, we, we had a very nice kickoff meeting where I assembled my whole team. I have a whole group of consultants that are experts in each one of these areas. And we got together with uh, administ admin the administration and, and uh, some of the facilities people and kind of uh, asked them for their kind of download of what they see the issues are with the facility and give, appraise us a little bit of the history and things like that. And then we uh, kind of, you know, came to an understanding of what priorities were and uh, 
and then went through our kind of lines of communication and logistics and things like that. So we have just really started our first row uh, round of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you've got a 300,000 square foot building. It's pretty big, it, you know, it's <laughs> it takes some time. It's gonna be multiple trips to come and see this for each one of these groups of people. So, uh, so, so we're, planning, we're planning that uh, uh, in November and then early December to get, have all this field work done and then take, uh, take a December basically to start to do the evaluation and the pricing and the cost estimates and things. And then uh, 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 in January start to turn it into a report and kind of synthesize that into options. So, so, uh, so what we hope to do is that uh, each one of those, at each one of your board meetings, in the, in the coming months, I'll come and appraise you of where we are in each one of those processes, all right? So, so this is the first one I hope to be at and uh, of, of several more. Uh, so really, so we had this initial uh, kickoff meeting and then this is just a quick sketch that uh, actually I was keeping track of where we were, you know, in what we've, what we've looked at, so, uh, so we're kind of, Working our way through the through the facility, uh, we've we've looked at you know a bit of the grounds, identified some issues. You can see you know conditions of uh, tennis courts and some asphalt paving and concrete paving and some drainage kinds of things going on. Uh, we're we're evaluating the floors, walls ceilings, equipment within each of the classrooms and things to see their condition and, you know, including marker boards and things like that. Uh, in the mechanical systems, you know, we're looking at the age of them and noting any unique features such as uh, this building has a, has a tunnel that runs around the complete perimeter of it that's kind of abandoned, but you can see it's got water in, in parts of it, so that's maybe something we get a, a little concerned about uh, and then uh, and then you know looking at at the age of the plumbing fixtures and you can see here there's been been if you look at the sink the sink there that that's an art sink and has a kind of creative uh, clay trap underneath it which is a five gallon bucket so so that's <laughs> maybe you know there's been some improv improvisations and things going on and things and there's some aging leaking uh, galvanized piping which is quite common with facilities of this age and uh, uh, and then then looking at at you know how the lighting how the lighting is uh, it's very interesting that that uh, most of the classrooms have surface mounting light, light fixtures and that's really because of the sound abatement project that went through. So they put, they put the insulation across the top and if you put the lights below the ceiling then you can get a nice continuous blanket of insulation above the ceiling to help with sound for the airport noise and things. So it's kind of interesting things to find out. Uh, you're obviously not, not in all, most of the building not up to the new LED kinds of Things. So you have lots of light bulbs around and fluorescent light bulbs, and that's really kind of where we are. Uh, I just had the, our roofing guys were just out today. Uh, they were scheduled for last week, but we had some snow and things, and it's hard to see the hard to see the roof in the snow. And so, so they're just downloading some photographs and things to me right now. So, so that's where we are, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, hope to give you some more kind of kind of better more opinions maybe next time and and that's it any questions so so your roof is see everyone says it's a roof but we actually think it's 64 different roofs because there's all sorts of these different additions that have happened and they're all in little pieces and they're all at varying stages of aging so it's not an easy one thing so the initial response is there's maybe five or six that are probably should be addressed within the next year to five years. And yeah, yeah, and it's just get, getting older. You know, some are older than other ones, other parts, and then it kind of staggers up there. Six, we usually evaluate it six to 10 years and then 10 to 20 year kind of span. And, uh, you know, the good news is, is there's only a few of the, of the one to fives. Right? Okay. I think one of the issues, though, is sealants. Like, 
like around windows and has, hasn't been done since the windows were first installed for the abatement back so that it's really cracking and stuff. So yeah, so some of those kinds of things we're just starting to discover, so yeah. You're welcome. Okay. Very All right. good. All right, thank I you. Think thank, you. Yep. Thanks. thank you, Colby. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. <laughs> Next is our district financial audit. Um, okay, Shannon Pichard. Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm here tonight to to um, present the audited financial statement results for the year ended June 30th, 2019. Uh, you all should have a copy of them in front of you. Um, they are in similar manner as last year. There was no new pronouncements this year, so that means that you know there was nothing crazy and new like last year when I was presenting. <laughs> um, so you'll see they start out with the uh, independent auditor's report on page one. Um, the independent auditor's report points out that the report is on a modified cash basis of accounting. Um, it points out the, does everyone have their copies or do you want me to? It's the big one. Go to page okay. one. Page, page one. Um, is the independent auditor's report. So this presents a clean or unmodified opinion on the audit. It goes into management responsibilities for the financial statements, which basically say that management is responsible for the preparation and fair presentation of the financial statements. The next section says what the auditor's responsibility is, which is to express an opinion on the financial statement based on the audits. Um, page two actually goes into what that opinion is, and it is uh, basically that the financial statements were presented fairly in all material respects. Um, the financial information in, accord of, in accordance with the modified cash basis of accounting. And then the next paragraph just draws the attention to the fact that the district presents the uh, financials on the modified cash basis of accounting, which is Except, which is not generally accepted accounting principles, but it, it is accepted for the um, state of Illinois. The next section of the audit is the management discussion and analysis, which begins on page four. And this is a narrative um, overview of the financial activities of the district. So if you haven't read anything, I highly encourage everyone to read the management discussion and analysis. It's much easier to read and kind of just highlights the uh, two comparative years. The next section, which begins on page 13, is the basic financial statements. And this is where I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about today. Um, the basic financial statements, there's two pages, pages 13 and 14, which is the government-wide reporting. The government-wide reporting includes the cash and investments, which are also on the governmental fund financial statements, but it also includes the capital assets and the long-term liabilities of the district. The capital assets um, were about 18.7 million at June 30th, 2019, and you can see under the liabilities, the long-term liabilities are about 10 million. So the, that's the biggest difference between the government-wide reporting and the uh, governmental fund reporting, which is on the next page, mm -hmm. starting on page 15. And you guys are more used to looking at the fund financials, which is how uh, the district budgets. Um, so that starts page 15, and then page 16 is the reconciliation between the government-wide financials and the governmental fund financials. And then page 17 is kind of where I'm gonna focus on. Page 17 is your statement of revenues received and expenditures uh, dispersed for the year and shows the changes in fund balance. So you can kind of, um, as I mentioned, the report's similar as in the past. So it's most summarized in the front and as you get more into the footnotes, there's more detail. And then at the end is the supplemental schedules which shows um, all the detailed numbers that you might be more used to looking at from your um, <clears throat> from your budget. You can see the 
general fund is one row or one column, and that is the educational fund, O&M, and working cash combined. And then you have your next row, which is your IMRF fund. And then the third, uh, I'm sorry, um, column is your non-major governmental funds, which is your transportation and debt service fund. Your revenues received, um, the largest, most stable revenue source is your property taxes, which was 25 million in total. And then you have other local sources of 2.9 million for the year ended June 30th. Then you have your state sources. Um, it's showing as 12 million, but I want to point out that that includes on behalf payments. The um, state pension rules require the that on behalf payments be shown as both a revenue and an offset as an expenditure. So that um, state pension expense is $10 million. So once you back that out, your state sources are about $2.3 million. And then you have federal sources of a million to get you your total revenues received of $41.8 million. And then under that, you'll have you see the expenditures dispersed in instruction. It's shown as 26 million, but that again includes that 10 million dollars that's required to be shown. So once you back that out, instructions 15.8 million, supporting services 11.7 million, and then the other large numbers are the payments to other districts of 1.5, and then your debt service payments to bring you to total expenditures of 40 million. And then you'll see underneath that is your net change in fund balance. You had a positive net change in fund balance again this year in total of 1.7 million. When you add that to your beginning fund balance of 21.6 million, you come up with your ending fund balance of 23.4 million. Um, the board, one of the board policies is the goal is to maintain 15% uh, of your current year expenditures to fund balance. So you're, you're over that, which is great. You have a, overall the district has a, fun, a healthy fund balance and another year of positive changes in fund balance. Um, the other thing I kind of wanted to point out is that since you report on the cash basis of accounting, <clears throat> that the net pension obligation liability and um, corresponding accounts are not shown on the government-wide financials, but if you know there, if you can't sleep tonight and you want to read 20 pages of government <laughs> of pension accounting, it starts on page 30 through 50, so you want to jot that down. Um, <clears throat> but that is the, and that details out all the IMRF, um, TRS, um, THIS, and the uh, teacher's reti uh, retirement health plan, so the other post-employment benefits. And those are um, determined by an actuary, and it, the, it goes into all the details of how uh, those numbers are determined and you know the assumptions that are used by the actuary to determine what the net pension liability is. So accrual districts do show that on the government-wide statement. So it makes it much simpler when it's not shown, but <laughs> that's my opinion. Um, so. <clears throat> I mean, as always, you know, I want to thank Bruce and the business department. We ask for a lot of information when we're doing the audit, and they always have everything ready for us and are very accommodating. So they do a, a fantastic job. Thanks, Bruce. <coughs> Good job, Bruce. Yeah. Thanks. Ooh, I like your tie, too. <laughs> <laughs> and then with that, if anybody has any questions or would like me to go into any more detail on anything, I'm happy to. <laughs> I think, uh, uh, so Shannon, thank you very much, and thank you for your work. And, and Shannon is our lead auditor, as well as I think a manager and supervisor for mm -hmm. Matheson as well. And uh, this is her last report to our district. The firm is uh, not going to be with us anymore. Um, they're moving into other arenas, uh, still public sector, but not necessarily as many school districts. Mm -hmm. So we wish you all the best. We thank, thank you. you for your service. Oh, thank you. You did. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk it was later. the 20 pages of pension accounting. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But all the best to you, and thank, thank you. you very much for your professionalism and thorough job as you've always done here. Yeah. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Good to see you guys. I'll miss you guys. <laughs> All right, next on the agenda is uh, Mr. Rob Grossi. Always good to see you.
Um, oh, you got a hand up? Okay. Uh, it's here as well. give a presentation on our financial yeah. condition sure. projection. So um, I guess to begin, um, I've, I've worked with, with many of you, but there's some new faces in the room. Uh, my name is Rob Grossi. I'm the um, I'm a, uh, treasurer and financial advisor for uh, school districts in Cook County and the surrounding uh, counties. Um, primarily, I work closely with the Illinois State Board of Education on various projects and have been a financial advisor to the school district for about five years or so, uh, working on various issues. Um, every year, this is about, it's been about a year since last year, um, I'm asked to give an independent analysis of the district's financial condition. And I, I was telling the auditors that I was really praying I'd go before them because they really make the school boards tired with their, <laughs> with their reports. Every stand up and Yeah, <laughs> eat your chocolate. Um, so, but anyway, um, so, so, so what you're going to see uh, going forward is, is a, a historical summary of your district and my independent assessment, um, partially from working with school districts for um, over 30 years and then working with 30 or 40 school districts currently, I'm able to, to, to kind of see where trends are and see how you kind of compare uh, to other school districts. Could you repeat what you said to Strong Tango when you came in about the school? Oh, the, 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 well, again, I've been here for five years since the, the school looks beautiful. It, it, it's, it's, it's a, a stunning visual of uh, the, the, the sign at the beginning. And uh, I remember before the sign was even up and when you get in the hallway, I, again, I, I, I literally ten, tonight's board meeting is the fifth school board meeting I've had in the th last three nights. So I go to a lot of school board meetings. This, this facility looks as, as I mean, I, I know inside, I mean, it's in, inside the walls, there's some, looks like there's some things that have to happen, but, <laughs> but, but externally, it's, it's, it's stunning. So yeah, that's, it's Thank you. beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I got the clicker here. So I'd like to start briefly with the historical financial uh, summary of the school district since 2011. And uh, you could see that the red line, the red dots represent uh, revenues, and the blue dots represent expenditures adjusted for capital projects. So in years that you spent $3 million in capital, um, that didn't affect the line. So I tried to normalize it. So basically your normal revenues versus your normal expenditures. And this is the pattern that, uh, that I've seen. So first of all, first observation, is that between 2000, during this time period, your uh, annual revenues grew at a rate of 1.3%. That's as low as any school district I work with. And that's not, it's very clear to me what that reason is. 80% of your money comes from real estate taxes. So your, your district, as you'll see, is driven by the rate of inflation because you could only increase your taxes by the rate of inflation, generally speaking. So inflation's been averaging um, well, 2.1 the last two years, but it was below that prior to then. And when you approve your tax levy in December, it'll be 1.9%. Uh, the rest of your money doesn't grow. You're a tier four school district. So even though the state of Illinois put in $315 million of new money into education, you guys got 30,000 of it, 30, something like that? 20, $30,000. <laughs> you guys get about a dollar a kid actually of the $315 million. So, so unfortunately, that historical growth rate is probably gonna be something that you're gonna have to live with and learn how to balance budgets with and address capital with as much as possible. It's, it's a challenge. Um, on the expenditure side, um, expenditures, fortunately, um, have been able to grow um, at a rate actually lower than your revenue growth. So as challenging as it is for school districts to keep expenditure growth, which is to me the most important metric, if, if, you, if your expenditure growth is always below your revenue growth, then you'll never run out of money. So it's a beautiful thing. And, 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 and to, be, to be able to accomplish that uh, with this anemic revenue growth that you've had in your district is quite an accomplishment. And actually, you know, I, I work closely with Paul uh, you know, just as someone I, that I worked with mostly uh, over the years, 
Uh, the school district recognized that this challenge was coming and um, all stakeholders in this school district kind of worked together and helped um, create a, a path where the district raises its probability of have fisc fiscal stability in, 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 in this expected uh, difficult times that I think are going forward. So, so um, and it's, it's evidenced in the next slide, as you'll see. So this slide compares the revenues versus expenditures that you saw in the previous slide. So the zero line would be if revenues equal expenditures, balanced budget. So you could see that um, the district in 2015 and in 2017 had deficits. They spent more than they brought in. 2018 and 2019 is a different story. Uh, in 2018, the district had a $400,000 surplus, revenues over expenditures, and last year the district had maybe its best fiscal year um, that certainly within the projection period and probably for quite a while. And uh, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later, but, but, but this um, is, is kind of evidence of the district being able, that it's been able to stabilize its financial condition uh, despite its challenges. In terms of fund balance reserves, uh, the district's fund balances have been relatively stable. Um, and this uh, includes bond proceeds, capital expenditures, putting everything together, it, it's, 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 a, it's an amazingly steady uh, fund balance reserve. At the end of 2019, the district had uh, a little under 25 million, actually a little under 24 million of money in the bank, which represents about 9.4 months worth of fund uh, expenditure reserves. So projections are only as good as the assumptions. Uh, I worked with Bruce and James and uh, through independent uh, analysis and the assumptions are as follows, the major assumptions. In terms of revenues, we're projecting real estate taxes to grow at CPI, which is projected to be 2%, 2 which is the average over the last three years, but it is trending lower. Right now it's, um, it's trending at about 1.7%, but that could change. Um, we're and we're projecting that the district is still going to have very high collections. You, your district does a good job, or your community does a good job of paying their taxes, and and you uh, and and between that and and you know tax appeals are uncertain, but but generally speaking, the district has, does a good job of collecting almost all of its tax tax levy. Um, the next one's a simple one. General state aid is going to be flat. I'm fairly certain of that one. Um, uh, you're not going to get more money from the state, and it's likely that you're not going to get more money from the federal government. So, so your only growth in revenues, even though we know expenditures do grow, up, grow is going to be uh, increases, CPI increases in your real estate taxes, and if there's any significant new taxable property in the school district, because you can get a little bit more money for that. Uh, in terms of expenditure assumptions, um, we're projecting that the uh, uh, that uh, base salaries, and, and, and it's a kind of a blended factoring in subs and all that kind of stuff, are going to increase approximately 3% over the next five years. Uh, you, you still have a collective bargaining agreement, but that expires during the projection period, so some assumptions have to be made uh, with no meaning just for illustrative purposes. Uh, the district is projected to realize savings from 11 teachers retiring during the projection period. At the end of next year and the following year, there'll be 11 uh, teachers retiring that will provide savings to the school district uh, that will help offset uh, other expender, expenditure increases. Uh, employee benefits are projected to increase 5% a year, which is actually below uh, industry trends of 7%, but, um, but Bruce kind of thinks it's a, a solid number, and, it, and, and you guys have done a pretty good job of keeping your benefit costs below industry trends in the past. Um, purchase services and supplies projected increase at the rate of inflation, and um, beginning in 2021, uh, we're projecting that major capital expenditures are going to average about 700,000 a year, which is basically your historical average. And that includes technology, um, and anything that you would code with a per, uh, capital or non-capitalized equipment number. Uh, cost related out of, uh, out of district tuition will uh, increase modestly and that's kind of based off of um, historical trends. So uh, the projections would show that revenues are projected again to grow at around 1% a year 
And if the expenditure projections hold true, expenditures will grow at about 2.5% a year. So now, we, now, we, so now the projection has a, a, a trend of expenditures growing faster in revenues, which is a little different than the history. So this is a chart of what it would look like uh, if that happens. So the, the, the gray bars are, was the chart that I showed you before, revenues versus expenditures, and the orange dots uh, represent uh, what would happen over the next five years. And, and basically, um, again, you're starting with a nice surplus, but the surplus will get smaller. But I'm pleased to say that at this moment in time, uh, we're projecting surpluses in each of the next five years, which is something that uh, you shouldn't just take for granted. A lot of school districts cannot project that out the same way. And then in terms of fund balance reserves, your fund balance reserves will increase slightly. The months change a little bit because if your expenses go up, you know, your average monthly cost of expenditures go up as well. But, but uh, if, if, in fact, the projections hold true, your fund balance reserves will increase a couple million dollars over the next five years. So there are several issues that especially Fenton High School needs to put on their radar. Um, first of all, again, the major uh, factor that, that, that controls your district in terms of revenues is inflation. And uh, a good rule of thumb to know is that every 1% of inflation can generate about $125,000 more money for your school district. And um, so you can see the, the historical average since tax caps came into place, which caps how much you could increase your taxes because you're in a tax capped county, is uh, the historical average is 2.5%. And you could see that over the last one, two, three, four, five, six, about eight years, seven, eight years, the district has been below 2%. Has been below 2.1% 2, 2 or lower. And again, it's trending at 1.7% this year. So you could figure that um, your revenues are gonna grow. If, 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 if CPI was 2%, you're gonna get about $250,000 more in real estate taxes. You'll get no increases in any other source of revenue. And that's the extra money you have to play with. That's kind of the general rule of thumb. Uh, one of the challenges that the school district has, and it, it kind of um, it kind of parlays into uh, what your uh, construction person uh, referenced, although we don't know the conclusions of that, is that uh, every school district has a, a, a unique credit card, for lack of a better word, um, ability, um, an amount of money that you could borrow without going to referendum, and it's based off of what your bond and interest levy was back in 1993 when tax caps were passed. So if you're a school district, like I work with Homer Glenn School District that was debt free at that point in time, they have no ability to issue non-referendum debt. Why so long? Why did they go back? Yeah, why did they go back to 1993? Well, at least about, uh, after about 12 years, they finally said they'll grow it at the rate of inflation, but it was frozen for like at least 12 years. Um, Whereas another high school district I work with has a debt service extension base of $13 million. So they could borrow several hundred million dollars and pay back $13 million a year. That's how much you could levy in taxes to pay, your to pay the bank off for your, for your debt. So when we did the last bond issue, you could see you basically filled up your credit card. So that puts you in a different situation versus other school districts. So a unique challenge to your district is this is that if you have major capital projects that, you, that, you, that, that you're gonna embark on, most school districts have three options to consider. One is non-referendum, issuing non-referendum debt, which is probably the most common way. The second is to have to go to referendum for capital projects. And the third is to use fund balance reserves. So your district, the first option no longer exists. So you only have two options. Um, and I would, I would add that it's a positive that the district has run surpluses over the last two years and increased fund balance reserves because that will help you address capital projects because you don't have the ability, not all, maybe not all your capital projects, but you might have the ability to address some capital projects because your fund balance reserves have grown over the last two years. So that's something, when you can't, when you, when you can't issue those bonds, non, when you can't issue non-referendum bonds, it puts more of a premium on maintaining healthy fund balances. 
Um, the third is the third uh, or the or the next thing that uh, that needs to be on the district's radar is there are two major pieces of legislation. Uh, both of them, if they happen, would have a significant adverse impact on your school district. And the second one is a, is a major one that I'll talk about, uh, but it's, it's new, so I, I need to call it to your attention. Maybe, maybe you've heard of it, but, it's, but it's, it's relatively new and popular concept. So the first is the property tax freeze legislation. So every year, um, every year they talk about a property tax freeze, but probably for the first time um, in, 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 in my lifetime of working with school districts, Experts are saying there's probably more than a 50% chance it's going to happen. And uh, they, they, someone described it as uh, that uh, property tax caps and pension freezes are like Freddy Krueger. They just, they never go, you can, they never go, you, they come back every year and you can't kill them. Uh, they, and, and it's kind of true. Um, so the, so b the basic concept of what's going on in Springfield is this. There's a constitutional amendment for a, progressive, for a progressive income tax, where, where the rates for higher paid people are higher than the rates for lower paid people. And um, what's possibly gonna happen is that, is that there's gonna be legislation passed that says, if this constitutional amendment passes, which the governor and many others want it to pass, then there will be a property tax freeze. In other words, the legislation will read that. If, in other words, if you vote for yes, then you, you'll have a property tax freeze. It's a, kind of a de facto property tax freeze for the vote as an incentive to try to get this passed because the state really wants this passed to help stabilize their financial condition, which is you know, the worst in the United States of America, factually. Um, so what, would that, what that would mean to you is this. So Monday night I was at a school district and only 15% of their money comes from real estate taxes. So if 15% of their money's, it's a very poor community. If 15% of your money's frozen, it's not that big of a deal. You know, 0% growth. You get 80% of your money from the real estate taxes. You're as dependent on real estate taxes as anybody. So basically, instead of getting CPI increases, which are 1.9%, 2.1%, whatever, it would be zero. And we don't know what the, how long the freeze would go. There's talk about it being a two-year freeze, a three-year freeze, a permanent freeze unless you go to referendum. I don't know what the, the, the details are of it, but it's definitely something that could certainly happen. Um, the, the, I, I believe that the constitutional amendment question is in November, so two things would have to happen. The legislation would have to pass, and then the constitutional amendment would have to pass. But, but, but recognize um, that that would change the projections significantly. And that's, that's kind of one of the nice things about every year doing projections because there's always some things that come up that's good to know because you're making decisions that are, boards of education make decisions that are long-term in nature. Uh, it's good to know what's out there. The second thing, which is, um, I think, I haven't seen the numbers, but I've heard that there's 100 losers in the state, and you, I'm guessing that you guys would be one of the larger losers, is this. The state of Illinois puts about a billion dollars a year into the teacher's pension system. So they pay that already. They, they, they basically pay about a billion dollars every year to the teacher's pension system. And the proposal or the concept is that take the billion dollars and run it through the evidence-based funding formula so that you do, you do an equity boost. You Because you, it would give a lot of money to the poorest of school districts. So remember I said $315 million gave you guys about a dollar a kid, but the poorest of school districts were getting you know, $3 million, $4 million type of increases. Um, so it would, so what would, and then concurrent with that, the school districts would then be required to pay the pension costs. So for the poorest school districts, they would have to pay the pension costs, which is a negative, but they would get more than enough state, new state money to cover their expenses. Whereas your district would have to pay the pension costs, and, and which are very high, especially for high school districts, because salaries are high. And, but you wouldn't get any money from the state, or very little money from the state to offset that. So it's, 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 a, it's a rare piece of legislation that appears to have losers and winners there's discussions about putting a, a, a hold harmless in there where you can't lose money. 
but there's concerns about the hold harmless. I'm actually was uh, just asked to be on a committee that meets December 9th to, t to start this concept uh, with, the, with the people that created it and, and, and other school districts. So I'll definitely keep Bruce and James posted on it. Uh, and I, d I think that you're gonna hear a lot about it. Uh, are you Ed, are you, uh, what's your association? Lend. Yeah, you're gonna hear a lot from Lend. Um, is, is, is that Peg Agnos? Yes. Yeah, she's on the committee as well. And um, so it's, it's definitely something to put on your radar. So the, the, I guess the three key takeaways that I'd like to leave for today is this, is that the district's current financial con condition is solid. You have healthy fund balance reserves and balanced budgets. Um, you, you really couldn't do much better than you're doing right now. Um, second key takeaway is that legislative actions such as a property tax freeze or this pension shift would dramatically alter your long-term fiscal stability. And then the final key takeaway is that the district must continue to strive to maintain healthy fund balances, healthy fund balance levels to address long-term capital needs and as an insurance policy to adverse legislation. Because an added variable that potentially is gonna come up based on what I'm hearing at today's meeting is that there might be some capital expenditures above the 700,000 a year numbers that are embedded within the projections. So you're doing a great job, but, but, but certainly there, there, there could be some some rough spots they have to navigate through if some of this stuff happens. <coughs> that ends my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for, for Rob? Rob, just a quick question, because I know, you know, we've, we've spoken about the threat of, you know, pension, you know, the cost of the pensions being shifted over to school districts in the last few years. Mm -hmm. How much has it now changed because of the new influx of revenue that's coming effective January 1st. I mean, there's more projected revenue coming into the state that should filter. You know, the, the gambling and the marijuana? The, basically. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I know Fenton being a tier four school, no. we'll probably not see the benefit of it. But is, is that threat of pensions being shifted to school so, districts mitigated as a result of that? Or are well, we still looking at the same? Well, part, part of the problem is, is that the state is billions of dollars in debt. So, so New revenues will help mitigate that a little bit, but the, ra the rating agencies have said in the past, you know, and, 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 and it's a major um, influence to what the state does, is that if you don't shift the pensions, you know, you're th you're th we're threatening a downgrade of, of, of your rating. So that's a key component to it. So, so the additional money will help, but they've pumped in, again, this is where Fenton, I've been working with school districts for 32 years. School districts like Fenton for the first 27 years of, of, that I've worked with school districts, it didn't matter what Springfield did. I mean, you guys basically don't give us money. From, a lot of schools were saying, we don't, we don't need your money, stay away from our, you know, our business. You know, and, we're, and we're content with that. Now I argue that the poorest of school districts are the safest of school districts versus Fenton. Over a billion dollars have been pumped into education since the evidence-based funding formula. And I'd work with school districts that have benefited significantly from it. But from your perspective, the billion dollars causes a strain on the state, because I, I, I'm not so sure that, I, that they have the money to do it. It's, it's a little bit smoke and mirrors. Um, but you're, so it's causing more stress on the state, which causes more radical action, such as whether it's positive or ne negative gambling, uh, making gambling legal, making marijuana legal, progressive income tax, all this stuff. All this stuff, to me, is, is primarily caused by an evidence-based funding formula that they never really had the money to fund. But it just sounds politically correct to add $300 million in every year as a goal to bring up the poor school districts, which is a good goal, but the state doesn't have the money. So, so what that means is that it puts more strain on the state. Now, the poor districts, they're benefiting from it, so the strain is, is mitigated a little bit. But for you guys, you don't benefit from the added money, but you're going to probably pay the price from the strain that, that's caused by it. So um, you're not positioned very well, I don't believe, going forward. And, and, and I think that... Um, you know, the, the district, and I know, and, and I know you were very involved in it, 
the district has to continue to think long term as they're making their as they're making these decisions. And you need to be careful if you have major capital. Uh, you know, you have to, you know, talk, you know, work closely with Bruce and and and, and how much fund balance reserve you're comfortable using towards any of these projects. Um, you need to um, continue to run as efficiently as possible. If you look at your uh, expenditures, I mean, your expenditures in 2019 were um, the same as they were in 2014. You, you, you've been able to keep your expenditure growth. You guys are doing a great job. And, and, and I mean, all you could do is continue to do that as much as possible. Um, you are going to benefit somewhat from the retirements that you're going to realize. And that's why the projections have you still running surpluses. But, but know that um, I, I think they'll be challenging. To, your board members are going to earn your money. You, you get three bucks next year. <laughs> That's a good one, right? Good one. <laughs> Earn that cupcake. Uh, <laughs> it's, I know school board no, no, members no, don't get paid. <laughs> and right now, but there's a proposal for school board members to get paid, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. From where? Illinois. I don't know who's proposing it. The delegation's voting on it. If, mm -hmm. if a shift, you know, let's say for, for pension, which is, as I understand it, our biggest mm -hmm. threat right now, should occur, would it would it be at a, at a, at a graduated level, or would it, I mean, I know it's hard to say. I, I don't I know what it looks like, but my guess, I mean, I'm trying to think of both sides. I mean, it, it, is that, it, I mean, it might depend on whether the new billion dollars is graduated as well. You know, if they, if they pump the billion dollars that they're paying TRS into the system, then I would imagine that they would want significant, I'm speculating, that they would want ex significant expenses to shift at that time as well. Now maybe there'll be a hold harmless that will phase out or, or, or be around, which costs money. Um, but, um, you know, we're, we're at, I'm assuming that we're gonna see, the, the, the discussion's gonna be 850 school districts in the state, Here's how much more money you'd get from the state, and here's how much your estimated additional pension costs will be. And they're going to, and, and it's my understanding, I haven't seen any spreadsheets, that there'll be 100 districts that the additional expenditures are going to be higher than the additional revenues. And my guess would be, logically, that it's the tier four and tier three school districts. There's tier one, tier two, tier, tier three. Tier one's the poorest school districts in terms of being underfunded relative to their um, adequacy target, how much money they should have. Tier four districts are, according to the formula, at 100% or better of their, um, their adequacy target, which is where Fenton is right now. So there's, there's not a lot of empathy for tier four districts as they're considering things like this. And we're still at the beginning of the, the front end of tier four. Because I think the last time we talked that we're like we're not at the end of tier four, we're at the beginning. You're, I mean, the, the, the poorest part of tier four. So, yeah, well, tier four. I mean, there's not a huge difference between tier four and three. I mean, j just to put into perspective, of the money that comes in, so there's 312 million dollars that went into the formula. 50 percent of the money by law goes into tier one, so 156 million. 49 percent goes into tier one and tier two. So they take first 50% goes to all tier one districts. 49% gets split up between tier one and tier two districts. Nine tenths of 1% of it goes to tier three and one tenth of 1% goes to tier four. So you would, and I guess you could say you get nine times more money, so maybe you get like $9 a kid instead of $1 a kid. But it's not, it's, it's, it's I mean, it's, tier three is better than tier four in terms of funding, um, but uh, I, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know what percentage you're at. The last I saw was around 108 ish or something like yeah, that. So you're not at the very cut line. The cut line is 100 percent. Okay. Well, help me. Help me if I misunderstand this, but it, it seems to me that our, our property tax freeze is a bigger uh, revenue threat, uh, immediate revenue threat than uh, than this legislation. I, I, I think it depends it. on how long the pro what the property tax freeze looks like. I, 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 if it's a two year if it's a two year freeze then you know you could you could withstand that i mean it would it would it would hurt you but it, but you could withstand that if it's if it's 
three years, four years, five years, or a permanent freeze where you have to go to the, the voters to get it off, you know, depending on the voters' appetite to take it off, that, yeah, if, 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 that, if it was a long-term freeze, whether, however it's designed, then, then, then I, would, I would agree with you. So, so, they, so they both have, um, again, they're, they're both big vulnerabilities to your school district. You, you wouldn't fare well. Um, I mean, with the evidence-based funding formula, when it came out, and I remember talking to the board about it, um, it was that there's going to be real big winners, and the bad news is you're not going to be a big winner, but you're not going to get anything from it. This bad news is worse than it's not going to impact you. I mean, it, it definitely could have an impact. And again, I've been contending for years that something ultimately is going to happen because the state is in really bad financial shape. So smoke it up and gamble a lot. <laughs> encourage. We just had a discussion. <laughs> and, and, yeah. Yeah. No, I don't encourage. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Rob. You, Rob. Thanks so Thanks, much. Rob. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce, for keeping us in the blast. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very for much supporting our decisions. Yeah. Uh, yes. If you could, please, yeah. Michelle. Next is teaching and learning career pathways. You want to stretch your legs, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you have. It's just the speaker. Well, that's some pretty serious business. <laughs> um, I can't believe we're looking at charts for 2034. It's incredible. I'm going to argue that what we see on the screen is maybe even a more serious business than anything else. These are our kids. That's what we do with them every day. And um, we have some really incredible things happening in teaching and learning. I think this picture alone exemplifies that we're getting kids out of their chairs, out from rows and... Um, sitting and just listening and really actively learning. Um, in this picture you see students looking at boards and on these boards um, there's flyers for podcasts that our students have done about people in their lives and the issues that those people uh, that are important to them. And if you go into our front hallway or our front commons, those, are, those boards are out there right now and you can take a QR code and you can listen to our kids tell their stories of their family members or people that are close to them and the important issues in their lives. And I think it was some really incredible work. So I just wanted to highlight that off the bat. But I am going to um, spend the next few board meetings talking to you about teaching and learning. And I'm breaking it up over um, this board meeting, December, and then again in February. So I, um, I'm going to start talking with you today about career pathways and the work we're doing around that. And then in December, we'll have a pretty hefty meeting. Um, that's when we talk about our curriculum guide, and I'll propose um, a new curriculum guide with some programmatic changes. So we'll go through those in December, um, as well as discuss blended learning and what that is and how it's um, starting to be implemented here at Fenton. And then all the way in February, we'll start to talk about our mastery-based assessment system. So I think we've heard about this, evidence-based reporting. We're using it in some of our classrooms, so I'll give you an update on that in February. So this topic is really exciting to me. Um, I think this is one of the most exciting things we'll be doing in the next few years. Um, we are working on career pathways for students. And um, you know, they say that students who have concrete plans not only um, are more likely to graduate from high school, but to attend post-secondary education institutes. Um, so the idea that we can help them better create these individual plans for themselves and have some concrete ideas about what they want to do after they graduate from high school or even after they graduate from college will set them up for far greater success than if we don't. So we're pretty excited about this. It's a long, long-term project. Um, we learned about it last year um, at III a little bit. Um, we heard 214 talking about the work that they've been doing for years. So we're excited that we finally got a start on this. Um, but it's going to take a little while. 
So I'm gonna take us through um, what it is and why we're doing career pathways, what we've done so far and where we're headed. Um, so besides the fact that it's good for kids and um, it ties in with our mission of relevance and rigor, the state is also telling us that this is an important <laughs> aspect of what we're doing. So there's the ESSA plan, um, right? Our Every Student Succeeds Act, national level, brought down to state level. So I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And then there's another post-secondary workforce readiness act through the state. So both of these um, state-driven um, government um, mandates or statutes are helping drive us in this direction as well. So within our ESSA plan, we are weighted at high school on a variety of things. It's not just an SAT or an ACT score anymore. There's a variety of indicators. 75% of it comes from academic indicators, but 25% of it comes from other things like our climate survey, college and career readiness, fine arts indicator. So you can see this year, 6.25% of our rating was based on college and career readiness. And then you look at 2019 and 20, and it's 0%. There's a reason for this. The state has recognized that we're not quite ready to track this. So when I show you the details of this, you'll understand why. It's quite complicated. And they're not prepared for the implementation of it yet. So um, when we look at 2020, 2021, you'll start to see that back on the percentages again at the same level of a 6.25% of how we're um, measured as a school overall. That's where our commendable rating and um, that comes into play. So for that 6.25%, that college and career ready indicator has to do with um, a variety of factors and they have this formula. You can either, so first you, a student to be college and career ready has to have a GPA of 2.8, 95% attendance, and either they have a college and career pathway endorsement under the Post-Secondary Workforce Readiness Act. So that's one of the options for the AND. The other option for the AND is they have all of the following. So you can see one's an academic indicator. One is that they have to identify a career area of interest by the end of their sophomore year. And the last one is they have to have three career ready indicators. So they can either have this pathway endorsement or a variety of bullets, okay? So when you go to like, what are these three career ready indicators? Because what if we don't have an endorsement pathway ready for kids? Um, we're working on it, and I think we have a lot of potential to be positioned to have these endorsements ready for students, but in the case that um, we don't or it doesn't really fit what a student wants to do, these, this is another way a student can be ready. A minimum of three of these bullets is what we would have to show for a student. Now we have 25 hours of community service built into what we do already. That's great. But we would have to have at least two more bullet points for a student to show that they're career ready. So it can be an industry credential, career development experience, military service, completion of a program of study. A program of study would be a little less robust than an actual endorsement, um, but it's still, they would take a sequence of courses towards a career area of interest. Um, consecutive summer employment, two or more organized co-curricular activities. So th there's some options here, but ultimately the, the, the gist of it's getting at, let's make sure they're career ready. <laughs> and yeah, and um, all of these marks, this is directly from the state. This is the kind of documents that we have right now. They're working documents, many of them. They don't have like a clean version. So this is right from the state. Yes, they took our OTC off and they changed workplace learning to career development. And, um, and you can see dual credit and a career pathway course is on there. Um, so there, there are some options for us. So we're trying to sift through these requirements and make sure that we're positioned to ensure that our students have these opportunities. And um, you know, prioritize and make some decisions about what's gonna be most important here at Fenton for our students. So, um, but that, that's what the, the, 
the mandate is holding us to right now. Um, out of the Post-Secondary Workforce Act, we heard about these career pathway endorsements. These are the four um, requirements. So they would have to come, a student would have to complete an individualized learning plan. So it's just setting a, a path around their interests, possible career um, interests, and um, what kind of courses they take, what are their college aspirations, things of that nature. Um, Career-focused instructional sequence, a professional learning including career exploration activities, 60 hours of career development experiences like internships, um, team-based challenges, and the demonstration of readiness and reading and math at the post-secondary um, level. And they, they're offering these endorsements, the state, in seven different areas. So I'll take you through those in a couple slides. So what are we doing <laughs> to address all of this? <laughs> so we have a steering committee together. Um, uh, we have a career pathway steering committee. Right now it's um, just teachers and administrators will be positioned to expand that steering committee to a variety of other stakeholders really soon. Um, but we just wanted to kind of wrap our heads around all of this first. So we've developed a mission, we've developed some outcomes for what we'd like to see in our career pathway programming, and we've prioritized potential career endorsement areas. So this is the mission that um, the Career Pathways Committee has, steering committees developed. It says, at Fenton, every student deserves an authentic and challenging experience that is personalized to build skills for an evolving future. Um, these are our outcomes. We want to develop career programs of study with on and off ramps. Right now we have a lot of courses, which is great, but they're in so many different types of pathways. Um, we, um, I don't want to say rarely, but many of ours don't have a clear sequence that take them through an, an, a whole program of study that can get them deep into some of these learnings of, in different careers. So it just gives them an orientation to it or you know, some, um, uh, some like level one, maybe even some level two type of learning, but doesn't get, in, get them into the depths of what they're interested in at times. So, we want some career awareness, of uh, community awareness of careers. When we say community, we mean students, families, uh, teachers, uh, other stakeholders. It's, we don't know a lot about careers as educators. I mean, we're just starting one of our career pathways now, and believe it or not, we're learning something new every single day. Every time we sit down together, we're like, whoa, there are so many facets of this work that we're unaware of because we've been content experts for so long. So um, it, it's exciting, but it's also um, ripping off. <laughs> the, it, it's, it's starting, to, it's exposing us to what we don't know. <laughs> and. Yeah, it is, it is. So um, student on-site career experiences. We wanna get them on-site in industry, in, in uh, job sites earlier and sooner so they can start to feel what it is to um, work within the area of interest that they might have. And we are hoping that they might go to an area of interest and be like, whoa, I really thought I wanted to do this. And whoa, no, I don't want to do this. It'll save them a lot of money in the end. So we want to make sure that there's some exposure and some on-site um, opportunity. Um, I talked about these individualized learning plans and resumes. We want students to walk out with really solid resumes. Um, and a plan about how they're going to get to their interest area. And I think number six is probably the most important. We're, we're, we're really developing this motto that says, every student will leave college ready. It doesn't necessarily mean every student's going to college, but everyone will be ready because the sophistication of skills needed at, in the trades or in technical fields is just as great as those students entering a college setting. And we need to take the stigma off of different types of careers that don't require it and say that you, you know, if you're going into the military, you're taking the ASVAP. And the better you do on that test, the better job you're going to get into the mil in the military. So there's trying to ensure that there's this understanding of whatever we do create, it's about 
ensuring that our students have a high level of intellectual thought when they leave here. So, um, and it means that all students could go into college if they wanted to. Um, and then finally, we, this is embedded in all of this work above and one through six, but we think number seven had to have a standalone. None of this work gets done well unless we have partnerships with industry professionals and cross-sector agency partnerships. So what I mean by that is we're working with our feeder districts. We're working with our post-secondary education inst institutes. Those are our cross-sector agencies, um, our workforce agencies within the community, and then our industry professionals. If we're going to create a computer and information technology pathway, we better be sitting with those industry professionals and making sure we're creating courses that make sense for where the industry is and what the industry demand is. So um, pretty exciting stuff, but a lot of a lot that goes into it, obviously, with all these outcomes. So these are the seven areas. We've, um, we've taken, a, it's not a hard, steadfast um, prioritization, but starting from left to right is kind of how we've said, this is how we'll tackle each one of these seven areas. We'll start with commuter, com computer and information technology, um, manufacturing, engineering, technology, and trades is our next priority. Health sciences and technology, human and public services, arts and communications, finance, excuse me, and business services, agriculture, food, and natural resources. So when we, when, it doesn't mean we ignore the stuff to the far right because there's still work being done in those areas. We already have courses in arts and communication and finance and business services, but we have to do some heavy lifting in those first four areas um, and for a number of reasons. One, that's where the greatest job demand is in some cases. Um, two, our, that's where our students have told us they want to be, especially in the health sciences and technology. About 50% of our students report on Naviance that they want to be in health sciences and technology. And just kind of where we have the most uh, deficit in our programming right now. Um, so those are some of those areas and why we chose them. So where are we headed? Um, these are some of our priority action items right now. Partnerships is the first one. Um, a CTE local needs assessment. I'll talk to you through these. I'll talk you through each one of these. Career awareness and experiences and information technology pathway. So, um, as I mentioned before, this is this is embedded in every single one of our other outcomes, and it's. <coughs> of the utmost importance to make sure we do this right. So this is what we want to do first. We want to build advisory councils around each one of these areas with industry partners. And we want to start looking with our workforce development agencies at the real uh, labor market projections. We've been looking at data along the way, but to actually partner with these professionals in our community is, gonna, is going to be very important. Um, we've also already started working with COD, um, Illinois Institute of Technology. We'll have an, uh, a meeting set up, not ITT, but IIT, and um, about dual credit. Because anything we're building, we're looking into how do we position our students to have um, college credit when they leave. Um, we, do, we don't want to create programs of study that don't have it if it's at all available. Um, we also have to do a local needs assessment. Um, there's Perkins 5 as a grant. Um, it's the Strengthening Career and Technical Education for the 21st Century Act. Um, we get some money from that for our career and technical education programming. And they're requiring us to do a local needs assessment, some of which we've been doing over the last year and a half. But we have to formalize it. And I think it's going to really ensure that we can optimize that funding source. Um, because right now there's some areas where if we just tweak things a little bit, um, we could probably be getting even more money from that grant. Um, we want to realign our current courses to fundable programs of study. So we, like I said, we have these courses. We might have one here and one here. And if you actually have a whole program of study, Perkins gives you more money. So we're trying to optimize those funding sources. And we want to understand the labor market needs compared to our current programming. That's one of the largest aspects of this uh, needs assessment that Perkins is requiring us to do. Um, this, 
third area, well, the second or third area, career awareness and experiences. So you're going to see next, in December, next board meeting, we're we're redesigning our curriculum guide again. Last year we went from paper to online and we're adding another facet. We want to communicate what these career areas are and what courses we have that align to those career areas. So we'll take on a little different form and fashion. We hope that's a great communication tool to raise awareness for the stakeholders, families, students, and like, why would I take this course? Because it relates to this career and what the career outlook might be in each of those areas. So we're going to um, have an, a new look for some of our um, program guides. Um, we are looking at summer camp opportunities for our students. So there's sometimes engineering camps that are held um, at different universities throughout our regional area and the uh, STEM and um, sometimes in the arts and sometimes, you know, with coding. And we want to give students those opportunities. And we've, um, we've written it into funded out of Title I, so we actually have some monies available to ensure students have those opportunities. Um, and we've started building some of our own here at Fenton, um, but we can also use those um, secondary institutions that are I'm sorry, post-secondary institutions that have developed some of this programming, like IIT, like COD. Um, Career-oriented um, career events. So we're starting to do like Hour of Code, our career fair. We're starting to build more of those events that start to expose students to more careers. Um, this next one around teacher externships, this goes back to what we don't know about careers. We need to get our teachers out into the career fields in which they're primarily doing their instruction in. Like, what does it mean to be a journalist? Let's go out there and see what it is. Um, what, what does it mean to be in manufacturing? Let's go out there and get into the field and, and see what this is and, and learn more about what our students might be entering. And then um, enhancing our internship programming. So we have an internship class. We're looking at making some modifications to that to enhance it and make it stronger. Um, we are, go like I mentioned, going to look at computer and information technology first. This has one of the greatest um, job outlooks in our country and in Illinois. I think I heard a statistic that there's 23,000 job openings in this career area right now or projected in the next few years and only about 20 some high schools in our state are actually programming around this. So I think what we're feeling is that it'll give our students a leg up and um, opportunities that are really going to be there for them and that um, you know others might not be prepared for. So. So that's the sum of where we are <laughs> and um, what we've been doing. We're just starting to scratch the surface. There's a lot of work to do. Um, but we definitely think it supports our mission to cultivate successful, passionate learners through rigor, relevance, relationships. We think the rigor and relevance is really there um, within this type of programming. And you know, personalizing students, Personalizing education for students, you know, is a passion of mine. What better way to personalize if you get them involved in their interest area and possible career paths? So um, we definitely um, think that this could um, create some wonderful opportunities for our students. So that is Career Pathways yeah. in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. Any Very questions? Nice. I know you guys have heard a lot tonight, so. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Very it goes without saying we're very yeah. excited about this. It's yeah. about time for Fen to, to start um, uh, creating pathways for, in, in regards yeah. to career. Thank, Thank you, you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you Michelle. Great. I think we got a video, right, Jim?
people. They are children, actually. There you go, Paul. So, Patty, what do you think that video is all about? Uh, the sharing of ideas, uh, bringing together a wide variety of people, teachers, educators, community, to share their ideas. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, just real quickly, that's our teaser for our portrait of a graduate. We're almost done. Thank you, Kit, Jackie, Paul, and, uh, and the administrators in here. Uh, we put in a ton of work. If I could just sum up where we've been, the journey for the portrait of a graduate, fall 2018, all three <coughs> district gathered in this room and said, hey, look, we're going to create a portrait of a graduate. And um, we're almost done. I think we're about 95% done. There's just a couple more um, things to do, which is to finalize the visual and how to roll it out to the community. And most importantly, you guys have to approve it. Right now, there's a tentative date for March 11th, once again here um, at Fenton, uh, for all three district two to jointly approve the portrait of a graduate for our district and to roll it out collectively start in August when school begins. So we put in a lot of energy and I just want to thank all of the districts um, uh, that put in a ton of time and a ton of resources. I'm uh, thrilled to make this that happen. all three Good. districts are working together to do this. Yes. It just shows the unity of the community. And I'm very oh. proud that you got that rolling. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. It's like pulling teeth sometimes. Yeah, but we got it done. <laughs> I did it. We got it done. No, but it's it's really you guys that, that put that together and um and some of the fruits behind that unity that you're talking about, Jackie, is you know starting the calendar together, right. you know having the early off days, the off days together. Yeah. So it's just Huge. we're our na we're neighbors. We, we we need to coexist together, and, and they're all our kids anyway. So just wanted to give you an update. Um, I'll send out an invite to Wednesday, March fourth. Approved March uh, the portrait March, March 11th. Approved uh, the portrait for the graduate. We need at least four board members to be there to represent District 100 and uh, we'll make it happen. Okay. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Uh, as, as you guys know, um, last month, uh, ISB released our report cards. Um, and the first one, this first slide is basically demographics. Okay. We've seen a little dip in, in regards to our, uh, our uh, student population. Uh, for about a good solid four, ye four years, we were at 1,500. Uh, we got a little bit smaller amount this year, but it's supposed to go back up again next year. There's a huge, I believe, an eighth grade class coming in. Over 400 students uh, are coming to Fenton next year. Uh, but that's our demographics right there. Let me just 28% white, if you could go back, Jim. Um, uh, Latinos are at our 64%. Our Asian population at three. I'm just going to take you to low income at 53 percent. Okay, Title One, as you guys know, what Michelle talked about. I'm going to give you one more number: English language learners at 13 percent. The true number behind that: we got 617 students out of 1473 that are ELL, English language learners, or former ELL. Okay, um, in the field of second language acquisition, to be fluent in the language. Um, for young individuals, it takes anywhere between 7 to 10 to 11 years in ideal condition to be fluent. Okay, I'm just throwing that data out there. My wife's a bilingual speech language pathologist, so I hear it all the time. Next slide, please. So let's get right to it. You know, I'm, you know we're, we're the type of board to say, hey, look, where do we need to improve? Very simple. We need to improve in math and English. Okay. Um, we did have good news in math. We increased by two points in regards to proficiency. But in English, we dipped two points. Uh, what you see right there, we want our students to be proficient, uh, which is to meet and exceed. And as you could see, there's plenty of room of improvement. Okay, plenty of room of improvement. We want those numbers to move to the right. Okay. Yes, we do. We really, really do. And uh, we're doing that through personalized learning, uh, our PD, uh, our um, PLC, professional learning community, and I, and what we're doing is this, uh, what Jackie was talking about in regards to unity with the district, we got to make sure this, this journey right here, what you see the numbers, 
starts at kindergarten, starts at first grade, second grade, and third grade. You know, it can't start at the ninth grade. So we need better articulation with our feeder school. Hey, look, how could we get them in a year in grade five and six and seven so that our numbers go up like this? Now, this number, where, where is this number coming from? It's from the SAT, okay, which is a big college entrance exam. We used to have ACT, the state of Illinois, this is the second year they use SAT. Who takes this test? Our juniors. Okay, our juniors. Um, the, you know, the, the natural question, why is our, you know, our, our reading or English is low? Well, we do have a population that's a, that's a immigrant strong, um, uh, but we want everyone to be proficient. Okay, next slide. Some celebration. We're a commendable school. Uh, two straight years. In fact, all of the schools in Wooddale and in Bensonville are commendable. First time ever, okay? So as a dish, as a, a community, one community, we're moving that forward. What else is something to celebrate? College readiness, early college work. That's your AP, okay? We're at 49%, the state is at 37%. Okay, we're just killing it uh, in regards to that. Post-secondary enrollment, we're at 75%, the state is at 74%. And lastly, graduation rate, we're at 94, the state is at 86. There are great celebrations here at Fenton, as you know, besides the budget uh, that are happening. Next slide. And another one which is critical to continue our graduation um, uh, tick up, our, our freshmen on track from last year who are sophomores this year, 93% of them are um, projected to graduate in four years, not in five. Okay, so that's, so, yep. so that's based on what the classes that they're taking like, yes. how does that yes it's yeah. based on the core classes that english math and social studies that that they take so okay. let's say you fail a, a class like let's say mathematics or algebra okay well the chances of not graduating in four years just dipped right so is this based at all on like their entrance exam mm -hmm. or you think no this one no there's strictly grades okay. strictly grades okay okay next slide that's it? That's it. That's it. Okay. Uh, any other other items? I think that was it. That was it? That was it. All right, so we move on to That was a long district. Uh, <laughs> it lasted an hour and a half. That was a long <laughs> one. But that was good. That was power yes, packed. Good. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of stuff. Yes. Right, you're right. A, a lot, lot of exciting to, things to report. A lot to report. Hey, kid. <laughs> I just wanted to say, we got pizza over there. I know yeah. you're hungry. <laughs> And the cupcake. Yeah, cupcakes. <laughs> took care of the cupcakes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we move on to the consent agenda. Anyone have any questions uh, regarding the consent agenda? Otherwise, uh, may have a motion that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda as presented. I will make the motion. Thank I'll you, Marianne. That. Thank you, Jackie. Roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Howell. Yes. Jalowick. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Ting Pao Pong? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Okay, then we move on to the next discussion item, which is the approval of the 2019 tax levy. Bruce, did you still want to, want to say a few words regarding uh, yeah, that? Yeah, I'll just run through real quick where we're at right now. Uh, so last month, October 23rd, the board uh, reviewed the estimated tax levy for 2019. Um, the uh, amount uh, approved amount was uh, recommended and approved by the board to go forward with was 4.97 percent um, the next steps then would be um, the estimated levies as I said was approved at October 23rd the final adoption of the levy is presented tonight November 20th for the board's consideration um, the 4.9 percent represents an increase of uh, over the 2018 actual extension um, and as I we said at the last meeting, but I'll just kind of review it briefly. Um, the CPI it's it's limited by the CPI, or five percent, whichever is less. Um, the CPI is one point nine percent. We know that. The other unknown uh, is new property that may come on the tax rolls that we're not aware of. So that's why we increase it over that amount to make sure we capture all the tax dollars available to us. So uh, we don't want to lose out on that. Um, so that's why we uh, boost up the levy somewhat to cover. Uh, us with any unknowns um, but again the tax cap legislation protects the taxpayers with that so we're not going to get more than what we're illegally allowed to capture um, 
but that's that's the reason why we do that. So um, we're asking the board to um, act on the and adopt the 2019 levy tonight, and the resolutions are included uh, there for your consideration. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Anyone have any questions mm -hmm. regarding that? Uh, then may I have a motion that the Board of Education adopt the following 2019 tax levy resolutions and certificate as presented. The resolution authorizing final aggregate, aggregate tax levy for the year 2019. Resolution authorizing and directing certain special purpose, purpose tax levies for the year 2019 and the certificate of compliance with truth in taxation law. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. okay so, so <laughs> Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Leo. Okay. Roll call, please, uh, Mary. Peyton Howell? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Ting Paul Pong? Yes. Jalowitz? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Okay, now we, we move on to the acceptance of the 2018 2019 uh, district audit. Which you heard. Which is what we yeah. were presented with this morning. Bruce, do you have anything more to add to? Uh, just very briefly, uh, Janet Bacar was this here to re morning. review the results, um, and uh, the board like heard it. those results. Hopefully, they were uh, uh, agreeable to uh, everything that you heard there. Um, and then the board is just asked to accept the audit results um, after that is done. Yeah, there were no surprises. And it was, you know, you've been very good about keeping us surprised to what's, what we have and have spent. And Okay, then, uh, thank you, Bruce. May I have a motion, then, that the Board of Education accept the 2018-2019 audited financial statements as submitted by Matheson, Moisky, Austin, and Company, LLP. So moved. Thank you, Marianne. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Jackie. Roll call, please. Peyton Howell? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Ting Paul Pong? Yes. Jalwick? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Okay, the next item is the report on shared services. Again, Bruce, I don't know if you have any. <laughs> um, <laughs> just, uh, I, I think this is pretty self explanatory that it really the shared services is our outsourcing kind of report that's uh, included in our annual financial report as well, but the board is asked to act on it uh, separately as well by school code. So um, it just basically indicates on page 218. Um, the items or agreements or services that we enter into um, that are shared either with other public entities or purchasing cooperatives or insurance pools and that type of thing. So all the endeavors and collaborations we have with those other entities are um, included on that report on uh, page 218 and the board is just asked to approve that uh, shared services report. Okay. Thank you, Bruce. Then may I, may I have a motion that the Board of Education approved the report on shared services or outsourcing for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2019. So moved. Second. Thank you, Leo. Second. Thank you, Marianne. Second. Roll call, please. Peyton Howell? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Team Paul Pong? Yes. Jalowick? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Okay, now we, re we move on to the recap of the policy committee meeting. And Sam, I think that's yours. Yes, we reviewed our 58 policies. Um, this is the first review, but the administrative recommendation is to update the recommended policies through, through the press service. Uh, Patty Jell, uh, member of the committee, uh, was here and reviewed them along with several other board members. Okay, uh, thank you, Sam. Now that was a discussion item, and we will have that on our next yes, board right. meeting in uh, December. Right. Um, committee reports. Bensonville Community Foundation. Anything to no, report? Nothing to report. Nothing going on. No. No. Okay. Finance Facilities Committee. We um, might, yeah, I'm we sorry, might, I'm sorry uh, Paul, we might have a finance facility committee as you hear uh, Col Colby um, uh, Lewis from STR present this, uh, this, af uh, this afternoon, uh, this, this evening. <laughs> this morning. <laughs> this morning. <laughs> uh, One of those times. So uh, that, that 
that is to be announced. Okay, so that that it will, will be forthcoming. Uh, the IASP delegate that's mining mine that's um, the resolutions committee report, which we had all uh, voted on, will be uh, voted at this meeting at the uh, AAA conference on the 23rd. Um, lend meeting, uh, James. I attended the lend meeting uh, last month. Um, it's basically what you heard from Rob. Uh, they talked about property tax summit, which is pay basically the detriments of uh, for Fenton uh, in regards to the property tax freeze. Um, you've heard it from Rob. It would it would have an effect on our on our finances. Okay. There's two items in the same line for voting on. Mm -hmm. Are they just like for property tax freeze and, or for the the, the, the sure. tax? No, the taxes having the, the taxes the graduated tax. the graduated the graduated tax. it is tied together they're you know, like so all yeah, one thing yeah, yes hmm. that's my understanding more to come on that hmm. okay uh, net sec um, I wasn't there also it was just the superintendent yes right. um, I forwarded you the digital copy of net sec's um, annual yeah. report um, as you know, we have approximately 25 <coughs> to 27 students uh, utilizing the service, the TLC program, and we have a program here as well. <coughs> Ninth School nice. District nice. Fund NEDSEC. And um, just to put it shortly, it's a valuable asset to have a valuable service. These are the students we cannot serve here at Fenton, and we need to service them, and they specialize in that. Um, we service our students up to their 22nd birthday. You said okay. we have 27? About 27, yes. 27. Okay. Okay, policy committee. I think you're all up to date. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all up to date on that. Uh, any new business, anything new anyone wants to discuss at the next board meeting? No. Uh, or any new business coming up? I don't think so. Okay. Then... Um, Kit, I know you said you had wanted to bring up something in regards to the policy committee meeting. Yeah, we didn't get to that at all. That's fine. Yeah, we just... Yeah. We did not, as you know, we didn't get to that. Yeah, um, so I think we'll, you know, part of it was my absence in the policy committee meeting, so we will defer it to a discussion on the next... And do some policy meeting. We yeah. can move it to yeah, the next meeting as a special policy committee meeting then. Or the next policy committee. For December? Or, or the next no. or, or the, the next, next policy, policy committee, committee meeting. meeting. Yeah, and I think by then there maybe more work will be done on a potential policy. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the biggest thing is just to, to make sure we get a consensus on, you know, is this is this something that is worth the board's time to look at, right? Mm -hmm. how, how does it benefit our students, our school? How does it align with our strategic plan? So those are the questions I would want to be able to answer. It, yeah, we can do that at that time. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now we have to move into closed session um, for the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the public body or legal counsel for the public body, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of the public body or against legal counsel for the public body to determine its validity. However, a meeting to consider an increase in compensation to a specific employee or of a public body that is subject to the local government wage increase transparent Transparency Act may be closed and shall be open to the public and posted and held in held in accordance with it, with this act. Uh, may I have a motion to go into closed session? Thank you, Jackie. Second. Have, thank you, Mary Ann. Roll, roll call, please. Okay. Peyton Hell? Yes. Ting Paul Pong? Yes. Jalowick? Yes. Figueroa? Yes. Ramirez? Yes. Wiedemann? Yes. Thank you. We will be back. Thank you. <laughs>
I'll make a motion. I will second the motion. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Marianne. May I Oh, may I have a motion that the Board of Education adopt the resolution resolution authorizing notice to remedy to Jerry Van Druska. I'll make a motion. I will second the motion. You. Thank you, Mary Ann. Uh, roll call, please, Mary. Peyton Hull. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Ramirez. Yes. Ting Pao Pong. Yes. Jalowick. Yes. Wiedemann. Yes. Motion has passed. Yes. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. I'll, I'll second that. Thank I'll you, third thank it. you, Leo. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> oh! Roll call, please. Peyton Hull. Yes. Ramirez. Yes. Ting Pao Pong. Yes. Galloway. Yes. Figueroa. Yes. Wiedemann. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Now we have. Thank you all.